Welcome to Advent. This is Father Mark Toops, and I'd like to welcome you to this sacred season of Advent and to part one of a three-part series walking us through Advent and Christmas and asking us if we are preparing for a day or are we preparing for a person. In this first talk, we'll together ask, do we really need a person? Or is our life now as good as it gets? Again, welcome to Advent. When I was a kid, uh, about 10 years old, I have distinct memories of 1982 because I have distinct memories of the years before and after it and all of the time that we spent watching LSU football games on Saturday night in Tiger Stadium. LSU football was a, a very distinct part of my childhood growing up with my mom and my dad. We'd leave early in the morning at 7 a.m. for the 7 p.m. Saturday night football games. We'd ride up there, and it was a great time with my dad as he'd tell us stories about his time at LSU. Most of those stories were true. We'd spend time with my mom and the friends that we met along the way, time with my brothers and sisters, and those Saturdays in the fall, LSU football remained some of the most cherished memories of my entire life. 1982 stands out as quite a remarkable year, not only for me, but for LSU football in general. That was the, the year that Dalton Hilliard and Gary James walked into the scene as two of the greatest running backs in the, the history of LSU football. LSU went 8-3-1 and one that year. Jerry Stovall, the coach, was the Walter Camp College Football Coach of the Year. And LSU capped off that triumphant season with a great Orange Bowl January 1st game against Nebraska Cornhuskers. Now, they lost that game, but I distinctly remember the season. I distinctly remember the buildup to the game, and I remember that Orange Bowl. That season was incredible. Uh, Dalton Hilliard and Gary James were two of the best running backs that ever have walked onto the field, and they captured my imagination. I remember being captured with Dalton Hilliard's size and speed. And I remember wanting to be Dalton Hilliard when I was a kid. In fact, as I was waiting for the January 1st Orange Bowl, waiting all of that time in December, I remember wanting to be as fast as Dalton Hilliard was. I wanted to be one of the greatest running backs to ever play for LSU. And I was convinced that if I just had Dalton Hilliard shoes, that I would be able to run as fast as Dalton Hilliard did. So I remember that year asking for the same shoes that Dalton Hilliard wore in the LSU football games. And every week of December waited for the gift of Christmas to come and the gift of those shoes to come so that I would have the gift of his speed. Well, sure enough, Christmas came and Christmas went. And as I unpacked my present that year for Christmas, lo and behold, it was not the very same pair of shoes, but it was certainly the same type of shoes that he wore. And I remember tearing through that box, those presents, ran out into the backyard, into the back street, and tore off down the street, knowing that I was uh, expecting to see smoke coming from my shoes because I would be as fast as the LSU running back. And Day in, day out, I, I wore those shoes and ran up and down the street. And, you know, I, I noticed that I was as fast <laughs> with the shoes as I was without the shoes. The shoes weren't making any difference. And, you know, as a 10-year-old, I just remember being really disappointed that what I had hoped for through the Christmas present wasn't coming to fruition. And I think what happened when I was 10 years old, is the history of disappointment with all of the materialism for Christmas, I think, began to take root in my life. And you know, since then, since 10 years old, it, it never fails. All the things that I fantasize about in December never really make me as happy in January, as I thought they would when I was waiting for them. You see, uh, there's something in the air, I think, a lot of times with uh, Christmas wish list, that there's a whole lot more wishing in that list than what can actually be fulfilled in our own lives. 
Can't tell you how many times I have walked into December 26th with my life no more changed after Christmas than it was on December 24th before Christmas. I've certainly had moments where I've wanted more, hoped for more, wished for more. And yet just because of the the secular nature of the Christmas season or just because of my own, I think, lack of receptivity or maybe just because of life in general, Christmas a lot of times just hasn't lived up to my expectations. And I wonder if we, a lot of us deal with the same thing. I wonder if a lot of us have uh, felt the fact that the culture rarely comes through on its promises. I wonder if a lot of us know what it's like to, to hope that this thing or that thing will actually make us as happy as, quote-unquote, the world said it would, only to, to leave Christmas just a little disappointed because it didn't do what it said it was going to do, or because that temporary kind of sensation just kind of fades away after a while. I think we want more. I think a lot of us want more. And perhaps the reason you're listening to this talk is because you want more. Bishop Fob most recently taught me that there is something in the air at this time of year. Let's call it Christmas cheer. How many times have we had other people say to us, I wish it could be Christmas all year long. And, and I have to say that I, I probably agree with that, too. I, I think people are in a better mood at this time of year. or There is just something kind of in the air. But if we want it to be Christmas all year long, what does it actually say about the rest of our year? What are we looking for in the other 11 months that we don't see, that we find in the month of December that kind of maybe speaks to a longing in our heart? And more importantly, what if God could speak to you today about that? What if he could share something with you today and in the next two nights where he could actually speak to the longings in your heart and so that this Christmas could be different? And what if he wanted to give something to you this year that would change your life, making this the best Christmas ever? Would you want that at this stage of your life? Welcome to Advent. Advent's a time of preparation, and you know, what we are preparing for is going to determine how we prepare. And if you and I are preparing for a day, December 25th, then that's going to influence the way that we prepare. But if we're preparing for a person, then that's going to determine how we prepare. A lot of times we get ready for a day at this time of year. We have December 25th marked on the calendar, just like we had Thanksgiving Day marked on the calendar. In, in the world that we live in, ordinary people like me, ordinary people like you, a lot of our preparation at this time of year is on a day. A couple of years ago, I was flying for Thanksgiving, and that means that the preparation that I had for that day was all about packing and traveling. The year after that, I was actually hosting for Thanksgiving, and that meant that All of my preparation was about shopping and cooking. You see, how we prepare the travel or the shopping is dependent upon what we're preparing for the day. Likewise, if we're going to use this time of the year to, to prepare for the gift that God wants to give you this Christmas, the question is, what are you preparing for? Because if we're just going to circle December 25th on the calendar, we're probably going to prepare for the day this year, just like you've done in years past. And if we prepare for the day this year, like we've done in the past, we're probably going to get the same thing this year that we've received in the past. And if your life is anything like mine, my history proves to me that what I'm really looking for can't be found in Dalton Hilliard's tennis shoes or all the other things that have ever been on my Christmas wish list because I'm built for more and I naturally want more 
And I don't think you'd be listening to this talk if you didn't want more. So the church gives us the sacred season of Advent because I think the church knows that, that we want more than what the world can offer us. If you look at page two of the notes, if you look at some of those PG-13 rated statistics, it's kind of staggering when you look at our culture right now with not only uh, the direction of our culture, but, but certainly I think the consequences of what the culture is offering us. If I have your permission just to kind of walk through a few sobering statistics. The first is that 50% of Americans consider themselves happy. That means that 50% of Americans do don't. Half of our nation isn't happy, and yet that desire for happiness, says Augustine and the Catechism, it said it's stamped in, in our heart. Our souls want to be happy because our souls are, are made for relationship, and, and half of our country isn't happy. 45% of American adults, that's less than half, believe that the world that their children will grow up in will be a better world than the one that they grew up in. Last year, Americans spent $140 billion on pornography, alcohol, and illegal drugs. That's more than the federal government's $130 billion budget for education. That's a staggering statistic. Last year, we spent more money on medicating our unhappiness than we did in educating the future of our country. 11% of Americans have an alcohol or drug addiction. 7% of Americans have a sex addiction. 20% of American men access pornography at work. And 50% of American men who define themselves as committed Christians looked at pornography within the last seven days. It's a great line in the movie The American President that says, when people are thirsty enough in the desert, they'll drink the sand when they see a mirage. And all of those statistics are coming from a culture that just gives us mirages one after the other because they know that we're thirsty for more. 11% of Americans are taking antidepressants. That's an increase of 400% in the last 20 years. 88% of American children believe in Santa. 78% of American children believe in Jesus Christ. That's a, that is a staggering statistic. Talk about sand and mirages. 88% of American children recognize Santa. But let me tell you, when you have cancer later on in life, you don't call on ho, ho, ho. And when your marriage is on the rocks, you don't believe in Rudolph. There are moments in our life when we need a savior. And yet from the very earliest ages, we indoctrinate our young children to believe in the mirages. Every five seconds, somebody on this planet dies without ever hearing the message of the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ. When people are thirsty enough in the desert, they'll drink the sand when they see a mirage. And I believe that there are a lot of us, maybe you, who are just tired of the mirages and tired of living in the desert. And sometimes you just get tired and tired. And that's what brings you to a night like tonight. And I think the reason why so many of us, um, we peg our hopes on a day rather than a person is because we just believe that life as we know it now is as good as it gets. Maybe the best we can do in life is cope and medicate Maybe what we have now is as good as it gets. And when we have that attitude that life as we know it now is as good as it gets, we're going to pin our hopes on a day. But maybe, maybe there's more. And what if there were more for you in your life? And maybe this was the time that God was actually speaking to you about that. And that's going to come from a person, not a day. And so at this time of year, we need to prepare for a person and not a day. But we have to be honest about where we are in life. And, and here are some indications that you and I need a person. 
this Christmas. Three Bs, and if you can recognize any of the traits, the qualities, the patterns in the three Bs, then it might be an invitation to you to prepare for a person rather than a day. Three Bs, we call those boxes, burdens, and boredom. And I share that with you today because I've lived all three. I've lived with boxes in my life and burdens in my life, and I've lived a lot of boredom in my life. And all of those are indications that you and I need a person this Christmas, not just another family holiday, not just another day with more presents under the Christmas tree, not just another another meal. We don't need another day. We need a person. And if you can recognize some of the patterns here, that's an indication that, that you need a person. The first is boxes. We can very easily live a compartmentalized life in the culture that we live in. And and I share this uh, with you because I've done it myself. And so uh, I'm speaking to me. I'm sharing with you my story. If you see any of the things in this litany of patterns that uh, registers in your own life, I just want to let you know that there was a time in my life where I registered also And so it's important for us if we have a compartmentalized lifestyle just to be honest about that because it just shows us where God wants to help us, where we need the person. Indications that you might live a compartmentalized lifestyle or indications that you have boxes in your life. This is what it looked like in my life. First of all, your prayer life consists of asking God for help, and, and that's about it. You know, it's never dawned on us that there might be a relationship involved, or it's never dawned on us, or nobody's ever taught us that it could be more. And so we have our God box, right? We have our church box, our Sunday box. But it's almost like what happens Monday through Saturday isn't connected to what happened on Sunday. It's it's real easy for us to to have God in his God box, and then we have our, our vocation box, like our 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 spouse, our marriage box, our husband, our wife box. Then we have our parent box. We have our job box. We have our recreation box. We have our retirement or our future box. It's like we have these little categories all throughout life, and none of them have anything to do with each other. And if that's where you are, I just want to say that that's where I used to be and like we're in this together, but we need to be honest about that's where we are. Here's another indication, the intensity of your commitment to God or to church or to the commandments is dependent upon the seasons, like vacation season or football season or hunting season or fishing season or the the travel or shopping season or your kids' sports seasons. And there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves. But if our relationship with God and our commitment to the commandments and to the church is influenced by those things. If the intensity of whether or not we do the basics, like going to Mass or not, is dependent upon those other seasons, then it could be an indication that we we haven't allowed the Lord into the rest of our life. It's like we have everything in boxes. It's never dawned on you or me or us who have boxes to ask God how much money we need to live. What should we do with our finances? How do we raise our kids? What husband and wife, what kind of husband and wife should I be? Again, I've got God over here and I've got all these other things that I'm managing in life by myself. And it's never dawned on me to ask God, what does he want the rest of my life to look like? Now, look, I share the next one with you just out of great love, but just stay with me here. But you know, we live a compartmentalized lifestyle when our greatest disagreements with the Catholic Church regard teachings that would require me to change my lifestyle, especially the things that bring me pleasure. You know, I hear it all the time, you know, it's okay for the church to do its thing on Sunday, but the church shouldn't tell me what to do in my bedroom. Or the church shouldn't tell somebody what to do in the privacy of their own home. And my response is usually, well, if the church isn't influencing what happens inside the privacy of your own home, then who is? So we we have a compartmentalized lifestyle when I get angry with the church around contraception or about all the hot button issues because uh, the church should stay out of my private life. 
And that's an indication, too, that we have a private life, and I like that it's private. So I have all these boxes that are kind of lined up in my life, and, and it's an indication that we need a person if we have a compartmentalized lifestyle. I'm drawn here to Mark chapter 10. This is the story of the rich young man. I really think he has, I think, something to teach us about boxes and those who, who live a compartmentalized lifestyle. You know you know the story. He, he runs up to Jesus. I think he has a genuine desire for the question to be answered. Of course, what's his question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, there's an indication as he comes to Jesus that he has some type of knowledge who Jesus is, but notice he, he has no real desire for the person of Jesus Christ. He wants what he can get, right? He wants eternal life. And of course, Jesus says, well, you know the commandments, you shall not kill, not commit adultery, you shall not steal, bear false witness, not defraud, honor your father and mother, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And he says, I've done all these things. What else must I do? And Jesus looks at him with love and says, one last thing. Go sell what you have, and they come follow me. J- Jesus, he invites him into relationship. And because the rich young man lived a compartmentalized lifestyle, he had boxes, he couldn't let go. And of course, it, the scripture says he walks away sad. Hey, if you have boxes, join the rest of the human race. A lot of us do. I simply share it with you tonight to invite you where to be honest with yourself so that we can ask the Lord for help, and we'll get there in just a couple seconds. But if you have boxes, that's an indication that you need the person. Another indication that you need the person is just burdens. Maybe it's not compartmentalized life that you struggle with. Maybe it's just struggles that you struggle with. There's a great quote from Edna St. Vincent Millay. She says, it's not that life is one thing after another, it's one damn thing over and over. I think a lot of people, if you can laugh with me there, I think a lot of people feel the burden of that, that life is hard, it's always been hard, it's always going to be hard, and it's, it's almost as if they have no hope in life. So some of us just, some of us just deal with burdens, and, and I want to say this with great reverence, I know a lot of us out there are struggling these days with the economy, or some of you might be struggling in your marriage, and some of you might be struggling with your future or with addictions or with yourself, whatever it is. Hey, that's just called being human, and we're all in this together. But there's a difference between going through a season of struggle versus feeling like struggle is the only thing that life has to offer. Let me say that again. Some people, we can go through a season of struggle, a tough patch in your marriage a particular stretch in the economy. And those struggles are very difficult. They're personal. And I reverence the holy ground that we're on when we talk about those. What I'm talking about is not a season in life that has a beginning and an end. I'm talking about an interior attitude where we expect nothing ever to go well or we expect that life needs to be endured until I get to heaven, then I'll be happy. And some people live with burdens in our life. And if that's where you are, I just want to let you know I've been there too. But that's an indication that we need a person. If God knows your burdens by name, but he does not know your dreams by name, that's an indication that you live with burdens. If you're angry, even if it's just a little passive aggressive about people who have it, easy. That's an indication that you might be living with burdens. I know lots of people like that. They, they see people have a breakthrough. They see people turn the corner. They see good people being blessed by the Lord. And there's just a little resentment in their hearts because they're not out of it themselves. And, and they just don't feel like they're ever going to get out of it. And then you get tired. And then you get tired of being tired. And if that's where you are, I just want to encourage you. Um, Lots of people deal with burdens, but that's an indication that you need a person, not another present this Christmas. Uh, Here's an image from the scriptures from me. It comes from Acts chapter 3. Of course, Jesus is 
who had risen from the dead. He has ascended to the Father. And Acts chapter 3 is, is at the early beginnings of Acts. It's where Peter and, and John, they're just filled with the Holy Spirit. And God's working through them in powerful ways. And they go to the temple this day, and they meet this guy who's crippled. And the scripture says in Acts 3, 1 to 5, that Peter and John were going up to the temple area for the 3 o'clock hour of prayer. And a man crippled from birth was carried and placed at the gate of the temple every day to beg for alms who enter, from people who entered the temple. The man is not, he's not expecting grace. He's not expecting to be healed. He's just resigned himself that life is to be endured. And he's, the best he can get is to beg for the charity from other people. I want you to feel and hear the resignation in the man's heart. It says, when Peter and John saw him, he asked for alms. He paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. He didn't expect us to receive someone, which is the rest of the story, just something. The crippled man in Acts chapter 3 had resigned himself. There was an interior attitude in his heart. He just felt burdens. And if that's where you are, again, a lot of us are there. But it's an indication that you need a person this Christmas, not just another present. Boxes, burdens, and boredom. Now, this is our culture right here. And, and i got to be honest with you as I laugh with myself here. This is me a lot of my life, but I just think a lot of us are bored. Father William Barry, a great Jesuit priest, said that prayer is a long, loving look at the real. And if we're going to be honest with ourselves about what we need for Christmas, we have to be honest with ourselves about where we are outside of Christmas. I think a lot of us would recognize the, the litany of descriptions here. Maybe you're, you're bored with your job, you're bored with your marriage, and you're bored with your place in life. I think a lot of us might know what that looks like. What does that look like? That looks like uh, you're just kind of going through the motions at work. You're going through the motions in your marriage. You're just kind of going through the motions in life. Perhaps for you, life at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, however old you are, doesn't look like what you thought it would look like. And you're a little envious of other people who have things that are better than you. You're just kind of just disenchanted with where your life is and you're kind of bored. Indication that you're bored. You live for diversion. Now, this is one that I, I have to raise my hand here and, and just admit to you, I'm in this with you, that this is definitely, I think, um, kind of characterized a lot of my life, but I think it just describes our culture. We live for the next diversion, right? We live for the weekend. It's Monday morning, you're trudging into work, and you're already planning what you're going to do the next weekend. Or it's Sunday night, and you're already anticipating the next Friday night. Hey, in South Louisiana, right, we're eating one meal, and we're already talking about the next meal that we're going to eat, right? We live for vacation, we live for the beach, we live for the camp, we live for the next diversion. And it's just in the culture, especially, gosh, at this time of year, we just kind of came out of Thanksgiving where we just had a permission to, to, to indulge in gluttony, went straight into Black Friday, which is just another form of gluttony, have all of the, the, the secular Christmas season of December to kind of live in this world of diversion and parties. We have Christmas. And South Louisiana, right after Christmas, we have Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras takes us all the way into Lent, which is its own kind of world of, of, um, of religious diversion sometimes. Takes us into Easter. Now we have, we have the, the summer vacation. Then a new school year starts in August. Football season is around the corner. We can hunt again and fish again, and that just takes us back into Thanksgiving. And it's just one thing after another over and over and over. And we can become addicted to the next diversion that reminds us or, or, or takes our attention off of how unhappy we are in the ordinary. Here's an indication that you live in with boredom. You spend more free time engaged with a gadget, a television, a computer, a phone, than you do talking to real people. Here's an indication that you're bored. You communicate more through technology than you do with your lips. That's an indication that we're bored relationally. If you can respond to the question on what's on TV tonight faster, then you can respond to the question about who you're going to talk to tonight 
a real human being, then it's an indication that we're bored. If you can turn the remote on and find a channel in the dark because you know the remote better than one person who knows the thing that you're most ashamed of, then I think we're bored. We can spend more money every year. If you spend more money every year and yet you feel more dissatisfied every year, you're bored. And if you're on the back half of that 50% of Americans who don't consider themselves happy, then you're bored. And of course, this comes across most, I think, pointedly in midlife. And people reach their 40s, and all of a sudden they realize that life at 40 doesn't look like what they thought it was going to look like. And then they go buy a Harley or a boat or uh, shopping or they have an affair or whatever it is. And people just grasp because they're bored. To the scriptures, a classic example of somebody from the Bible who was bored, David. David was bored. King David, of course, King David, the greatest of all the kings of Israel, but there was a stretch in his life where he wasn't living at his prime. David was bored. I'm thinking about 2 Samuel here, chapter 11. I want to read this to you because I think it, it's an indication huh, of something. It says, at the turn of the year, the time when kings go to war. That's the spring, right? They just came out of the winter. It's the spring. The weather's nice. The time of the year when kings go to war, right? It says, David sent out Joab along with his officers and all of Israel. And they laid waste to the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. David himself remained in Jerusalem. Where is David supposed to be? David's supposed to be in war. It says it's at the time of year when kings go to war, David's supposed to be out in front with his men in the trenches. And yet David stays in Jerusalem because David's bored. He's looking for something else. And it says, one evening David rose from his bed and strolled about on the roof. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And David sent messengers and took her. And of course, the rest of the story is PG-13. That's the affair of David and Bathsheba, who, and, I, and, I, and again, PG-13 story here. You can read the rest of it. They have a child out of wedlock. David eventually murders her husband, Uriah. And, and all of that started because David was in the wrong spot. I, I tell guys all the time, when men aren't where they're supposed to be, men are usually doing something they're not supposed to be doing. <laughs> When men are not where they're supposed to be, we're usually doing something we're not supposed to be doing. David was not where he was supposed to be, and David wound up doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing because David was bored. And if you're bored, you need a person. You don't just need another diversion. If you have burdens, you need a person. You don't need another exhale. And if you have boxes... You need a person. Boxes, burdens, and boredom, those are three indications that we are not preparing for a day. We are preparing for a person. And if you have boxes or burdens or boredoms, I want to say Merry Christmas to you. Jesus Christ came so that we might have life and have it to the full. He came for people who live compartmentalized lifestyles so he could just be with us in the midst of it all. You know, his name is Emmanuel. We'll talk about that name tomorrow night, but if you're living a compartmentalized lifestyle, he wants to be with you. If you live a life with burdens, my God, he is a savior of the world. He wants to redeem your life. And if you're bored, my God, he wants to invite you into the greatest mission and into the greatest life of freedom that you could ever know or imagine. Boxes. That rich young man, as he walked away sad, it says in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, that Jesus looked at him with love. Imagine what would have happened if that rich young man would have just turned around and looked at Jesus and said, I need help. I can't go home and do this by my, myself. Can you help me with my boxes? And my friends, if you are struggling with boxes tonight, I want to I want to say to you that Jesus is here to help you. You just need to ask for help. You don't have to manage life by yourself anymore. You don't have to feel 
the, 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 the fatigue and the burden of life, managing all that by yourself. You're not designed to do that by yourself. He's here to help you. But the person who's coming at Christmas is wanting to help you if you can just let him into your heart. If you have burdens, I want to remind you who it is who's coming. It's not about a baby. That baby is going to grow up, and that baby is going to go to Jerusalem. He is going to conquer death, open up heaven in his ascension, remind us of where we're all supposed to be. And in Acts chapter 3, enlivened by the Spirit, Peter and John walked into the temple area that day, saw that man who was crippled from birth, and said, neither silver nor gold do I have to give, but what I give, I give freely. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And that man sprung up different with his burden lifted from him because of the power in the name of Jesus Christ. That person who's coming this Christmas can remove the burdens of our life. And I'm not saying that the external circumstances are going to change. Just because we believe in the name of Jesus doesn't mean that the price of oil is going to skyrocket tomorrow and that the economy in South Louisiana is going to get better. But I do know this, that the person of Jesus Christ can lift our hearts in the midst of of the difficulty, he can remove the interior burden, and sometimes he can even take care of the physical one too, if we just have the courage to ask the person at Christmas for the gift that he wants to give us. And the burden can be removed because Acts chapter 13 describes this David, who was an adulterous and murderous king, who got his act together and actually describes him as a man after God's own heart. I want want people to say that about me. He was a man after God's own heart. David did great things when he turned his life to Jesus Christ. God inspired him with a mission to lead people to transform their lives, and there's so much more to life than just another boat or another house or another car or another this or another that or another diversion. God can give our ordinary the joy and freedom that we are grasping for sometimes in the diversion. If only we would ask the person this Christmas. My friends, if you have boxes, burdens, or boredom, this Christmas can be different. If only we would ask the person for what we really need this Christmas. And so I ask you now, what do you really want from God? Later on in Mark chapter 10, after Jesus had left the rich young man, he found another man, this one blind from birth. And this one, when he heard Jesus was coming, was ready. And Jesus looked at that man and said, what do you want me to do for you? And I just imagine that God's maybe asking you that question right now. God is knocking on your heart, asking you, What do you want me to do for you? My friend, right now, in your heart, this Christmas can be the best Christmas you've ever had. But it starts by acknowledging that we need a person, not another day. And it starts perhaps by acknowledging what you need from the person so that we're more disposed to receive the gift that he wants to give. Until we see each other again, I I leave you with one question. What do you really need at this stage of life? Are you happy? Is there more? What do you really want for Christmas? Heavenly Father, we come before you as sons and daughters who are searching on the journey of life and longing for more. And sometimes, Lord, we don't have the language for it. But we give you our hearts even now. Pour forth the grace upon us as we search, 
as we give you our search and as we give you permission to fulfill our search. May this Christmas be the best we've ever had. May you speak to us about what we really want from you. And may you pour forth blessings upon us all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.